ambulance came to pick us up, took us to the uh, hospital and they said, you know what, all of his cat scans, all of his, everything came back fine. And then we said, we're just going to get the registrar to come in and kind of like sign off for him to be discharged. Mm-hmm. And then when she came in the room, she looked at him, they looked at McGee, she goes, hmm, does he usually blink like that? And I thought, blink like what? Mm-hmm. She's like, blink like that. And I said, I've never noticed that. She goes, hmm, I'll keep him in overnight because it looks like he's having some kind of seizure. I'm like, okay, so I'm a bit worried now because I'm thinking, oh, you know, um, I know his dad had epilepsy as a child, so I was thinking maybe it's a genetic thing. And then literally the next day, he was having like seizures, like 15 every hour, and, and just vomiting, and it was just non-stop. They couldn't do much. They kept on giving him rescue medication. But I think there's only so much rescue medication they can give yeah. to a baby, really. It was just ongoing, and um, this went on for weeks. It's three or four or five weeks of the same thing. They kept on telling me that, you know, he needed a lumbar puncture. And when I had them put that, that needle in, I had to go and take him out of the room. They told me he was blind, he was deaf, he, you know, all these kind of different random things are thrown at me. And I thought, no, he's not. They thought it was a metabolic issue, but they had no kind of answer why he was, you know, presenting himself as the way he was. And then I remember one day this consultant came over and I was with somebody at church whose daughter has, not main keys, but she has a different condition. And we were sitting to her, can she knows that consultant personally through her child? Mm. And um, he said to me, are you okay? I said, yeah. He goes, were your mum and dad be with you later? And I goes, maybe. I don't know. He goes, well, maybe they should come in. Mm. We'd have a conversation. I said, okay. I didn't think anything of it. But then she looked at me, she said, that doesn't sound very good. And then I thought, mm, okay. And I remember going into the room and holding the girl. And my mum and dad were there and they said, you know, we looked at the scans, we looked at everything. And we got a diagnosis. We don't want you to go into Google and look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the condition that we feel that Miguel has is one in a million. Children don't live to primary school age. Um and it's, there's no cure. I just remember just screaming and screaming and screaming in that room and screaming and screaming. And I take the baby from me and I just could not believe it. Just complete shock. I just remember that day like somebody kicking his stomach repeatedly and I thought, what have I done in my life to get this now? You know, first baby, good pregnancy, tried to do everything perfectly fine. You know, and I remember just leaving the room and going to the toilet and I said, God, in labor, I said that you're bomb in Gilead when I was walking in that toilet. And I said, God, I still will never, ever ask you why. You know why you gave me this child. Mm. But there's three things now I ask you. I ask you to, for Miguel to be an example, for his name to go around the world and for him to be a case today, right? And it was very random things that I asked for. Yeah. I never asked really for healing. I never asked. At that time, I never asked for that. The street thing. And within two hours, the consultant said there is a treatment he can have, but it's not life saving. It's a copper injection that you will have to give him daily. Um, but then again, uh, there's no NHS funding. So we'll have to apply for that. And it's not guaranteed you will get it because it's so expensive. It has to be made at um, Norfolk Park and transported here. And, and it's very expensive, you know, treatment. So that was another prayer that we had to put up, and thank God we got that treatment. And then the next day, there was a group of Chinese people, because it's so rare, there was always students coming to the room. Yeah. Um, wanted to hold him, and it was hard. But that's what I prayed for. I want to know that somebody who comes behind Miguel one of these students will pick up on something that may be able to save another child. And I remember a Chinese registrar coming and said, want to ask something, you don't have to say yes. But we just wondered if the case of Miguel being a case thing. And I looked at me and she laughed. She said, that's what you pray for. Within maybe two months, everything I pray for had manifested itself. Wow. I have people praying in Africa, India, all around the world for this child of mine. You know, 
or uh, one day I woke up in the night because it's, it's hard because you're in the hospital 24 7 for all the hospital admissions that he's had I've never left always been there and um, always slept over the night and it's hard because the regime that happens is that you have to have your bed up at half six in the morning so even if your kid has been up all night you got to get up you know what I mean so I remember what waking up one day and I heard loads of beeping noises I opened my eyes and there's like 50 people on the girl's bed drilling a hole in his leg. And I thought, God, I just, I could not move. I couldn't move. I just had to sit and watch. I could not move. I just felt like I was just numb to everything. Yeah. And I thought that's how my experience has been kind of with me get apart. God has just numbed me in certain places. Because I think if I had full feeling of what was going on, I think I wouldn't be here today. He made me... He, he thought me out in the right time. Yeah. When I had to advocate for Miguel and I had to say, well, no, I think he should be able to have the chance to walk. I think he should be given that equipment or I think he should be given the chance to have education and go to school. Yeah. Why can't he go to a special school or mainstream, whatever it is? I've always had to campaign for him. So God has given me the strength to not have to fight every battle, but he's fought battles, you know what I mean? And, and, and given me that time to rest. The thing about making is this, their lines in their um, body, their, their veins, they 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 flat, they clap. Right. So they need an emergency line to get in to give rescue medication. Right. You know? And sometimes they can't. It's just constantly getting flashbacks. What they call it. So they have to get an emergency line, and that's what they were doing. Right. But for me to wake up and see that so much people having to try and canalise him, yeah. take him down for emergency surgery all the time to get lines put in by these I mean, this is a big hospital that he's under, and it's only like few people that can do it. Right. So it, it, it's very hard because you have to wait for them to come out of the theatre, and it's just, and you just hope that he doesn't have a seizure. Mm. So then, by then, um, I think we got him anointed. Yeah. Um, and we just have got basically to intervene. And we had a week fast, prayer and fasting. Mm-hmm. A lot of people on Facebook supported me with and got involved, and that was fabulous. We ended the fast around Christmas. He was, he was admitted on the 22nd of October, 2015. Right. right. On the 22nd of June 2015, we were discharged with all this equipment, which is quite overwhelming. Like, you have a baby, you bring it home, and then all of a sudden you've not been home for like 10 weeks, and then you come home, your whole life is just. Um, he was on nine different anesthesia medicines. Wow. So, and at all times, so you have to make sure it's all right, you have to get them in. Yeah. It was tough. <laughs> it was really tough to do that. Um, but I managed. Mm. There were times that he never slept for like 72 hours. Yeah. He used to scream. And I used to think, God, help me. That was tough. Because when you have a lack of sleep, then you have no concentration. And then from the January of 2016 to the 21st of May, when he passed, he never had any seizures. Right. I couldn't explain why. Because they had removed all medication by January 2016. Right. So they just think that in itself is a miracle how a child cannot have any seizures. The more seizures you have, it, it affects your brain development. Yeah. So I was so anxious for him not to have them because I know he was very intelligent, mm-hmm. 100%. You know, anyone who met me going knows he's clicked on, he knows exactly what's going on, mm-hmm. not all. So I didn't want him to, that to be depleted from his brain, mm-hmm. like, any more than it had been damaged. Not many Menke's children have all these people, a team like him. They call it the A-team. Mm-hmm. Not many people get um, the top um, portage sense manager of the area of Nottinghamshire to work with a child as young as Yeah. Um, he, he's had literally a fantastic team. There, there's not many people have a team like that. The final as pregnant or was a shock. It wasn't planned. But... I was more or less happy. I wasn't sure about how everybody else would deal with it. They just 
some of it was just like, you don't think you, you'd be a good mum to both children. I think some of it was, no, I don't think all of it was from a good place. Okay. I don't think it was from a bad place. It's just people are different. Yeah. You know I mean, everyone has a different opinion, which I respect, but I have to listen to. Mm-hmm. So I had to go through the, through the pregnancy. But with that, there was the issues because Miguel condition men because it's, it's genetic on my side right um so therefore i had to have a cbs test mm. um which was tough because when she was doing the um case work you know you have to sign to say if, if there's an accident this just carries a significant risk of yeah. miscarriage um because they're doing very invasive procedures mm-hmm. and when she had the needle inside me um the screen that shows her where the baby is and what she, the, the dna the, the the cells she used to get from the the, the womb the screen went on to like screen save her so she was screaming to the person because it, it's just that sensitive yeah. one little nudge yeah. that baby is gonna go so that was horrible being that that, that stretch up, not being able to move, I'm thinking, God, please, you know, help me here, because this woman, steady her hand so she gets this needle out, mm-hmm. because it's just not a little needle, it's huge. Yeah. Um, it was a good three weeks, yeah. four weeks, mm-hmm. so that was tough, and I thought, you know what, the wife, if he had got main kids, I mean, they were going up to like 16, 17 weeks yeah. now, pregnant. I mean, I wasn't really showing at that size, but, you know, you know, you're getting attached to a child. Um, so on the 20th of May, 2016, I had a clinic appointment for Miguel and I told his consultant, you know, I'm pregnant. Um, I'm waiting for my results to come back, you know. But he's like, well, if you choose to keep the child, we'll make sure that we have the copper injections ready. If this baby has got me, I'm keeping him anyway. Yeah. So, um... That day when I got home, it was the day before my birthday, and they said, we've got some news for you. You are a carrier of Menkis disease, and you're having a boy, but the boy didn't have Menkis. Oh. I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I, I felt horrible for saying that, because I thought, um, I shouldn't say that, because I've got Miguel, and I would never change the goal. Mm-hmm. For you to give me a child that's born in a million, is, to me, is an honor. Yeah. And yes, it's not the diagnosis I want, but there's a reason why Miguel was given to me to look after. Mm-hmm. And I'm really proud that I'm Miguel's mother. 